My ex-wife lost a custody battle to me and then tried to pull off an elaborate plan to frame me for stealing from her and turn me into the police. But it all backfires on her. The first half of the story is the setup. Everything that happened in the divorce, a whole glitter bomb situation, and the second half is where she framed me. How she did it and what I did in response. Here's what happened. Subscribe to Am I the Jerk on YouTube and hit the bell to turn on notifications. I was married to a woman for 15 years and ended up divorcing her because she liked to sleep with other guys. While it took me six years to stumble onto this fact, she worked from home, I commuted two hours each way into the city, I owe it to her being either a sociopath or a narcissist, or both, why not? She absolutely could turn on and turn off the charm and could come up with lies staring at you right in the eyes. Hindsight is 2020. Let's call her V, short for Voldemort, as one time when I was talking about her after the separation, I referred to her as she who must not be named, and the nickname stuck with all my friends and family. During the marriage, my ex and I were best friends with another couple, and for this post, we'll call them Sam and Marie. Sam was, and still is, my best friend. Marie was V's best friend. Marie had found out about V's plans to cheat on me prior to me finding out and told V that she couldn't condone infidelity and their friendship would end if V did cheat on me. No, Marie did not tell me, and I don't blame her for not doing so. When I finally found out V was having a Facebook affair with some dude in California, we lived in Massachusetts, and if you're going to have an online affair, don't do it while married to a computer expert. It was just two weeks before V was flying him out and putting him up in a hotel for three days. I spent those two weeks getting a lawyer, a private investigator, and my exit strategy together. I left her the weekend after their hotel stay. She would spend the days with him and come home for the afternoon and evening without a shred of guilt showing in her actions. The private investigator having gotten some pics and video of them leaving the hotel and eating lunch together and heading back to the hotel. I first stayed at Sam and Marie's in their in-laws basement apartment, eventually moving into a small apartment back in the town where V lived. Fast forward nine months and I'm divorced from V. Why it was so short to divorce is another tale. We had one daughter between us still at home, Rebecca, she was 13 at the time, and we're trying shared custody and live about a quarter of a mile apart. There are other kids from the marriage, but they were living apart from us at that time and don't play a part in this story. We had acquired a lake house during the marriage and had listed it to sell and we had written into the divorce agreement to split the proceeds but paying half the mortgage on that and the rent on my apartment was really stretching me thin financially. One day Marie emails me subject line all in caps saying V just tried to get me fired. Long story short V emailed Marie's boss claiming that Marie was gossiping about V on sales calls to customers but her boss knew it was nonsense and told V as much. Wisely, Marie didn't mess around waiting to see what was next. She went to the local courthouse that day and filed for an anti-harassment order against V. It took several visits to the judge as V chose to ignore multiple summons to court so that the judge could hear her side of the story. Eventually, the judge granted the order because V never showed up to court. During this time, V called 911 on me multiple times, one time claiming I put a letter bomb in her mailbox, the other two times that I had entered her apartment without her permission. The letter bomb accusation was due to me posting a link to a website where you can ship your enemies glitter on Facebook months before and subsequently mailing her a thick bundle of forms to sign. Police were called and I had to go to V's apartment and open the letter in front of the police. Needless to say, there was no glitter, let alone a bomb. Oddly enough, this accusation came just a few days after there had been an actual bomb threat called into town hall. The two times I had gone into her apartment had both been to drop off Rebecca's book bag when she had forgotten it in my apartment. Both times I had texts from V granting me permission to open the door and put the book bag just inside. She would then text me after I had done so, trying to revoke permission. To this day, I think V thinks that if she deletes a message on her end, the message is deleted on my end. Even though kids will be kids and Rebecca did forget her book bag in my place on at least one other subsequent occasion, I did not fall for V's ruse a third time. All forgotten book bags were delivered by Rebecca and I meeting halfway between apartments. Also included with the multiple 
911 calls were multiple minor child wellness checks on evenings when I had Rebecca at my apartment. It's so much fun having to explain to your child why the police are showing up at 8 o'clock at night just to see if she is okay. Basically, V was trying to get me frustrated so that I would react badly. Throughout this whole mess, Sam and Marie have been lifesavers to me and Rebecca, my daughter, hosting and cooking weekly family dinners for us. They are Rebecca's godparents and just being absolute rock steady in their support and tolerance of the situation. Around this time, V filed for sole custody. At the strong urging of my lawyer, I insisted on being a guardian ad litem, a GAL, being appointed to represent Rebecca's best interests, her being a minor. Of course, the parents must pay the fees of the GAL. At this point, my finances are really getting worrisome. I write an email to V saying we need to drop the price of the lake house and get that sold regardless of profit. I needed that albatross off from around my neck so I could continue to afford to live where I could co-parent Rebecca as well as fight the custody battle. So there I am going deeper into debt, can't pay rent and mortgage long term, and V is starting another court battle for full custody. With no other choice, I move back in with Sam and Marie so I can continue to pay my lawyer and keep fighting. About a week after I'm settled back in with Sam and Marie, I hear from Rebecca that V's glass patio table was smashed the previous night. I was in New Hampshire that evening with witnesses, so it couldn't have been me. I was paying for Rebecca's cell phone and we have Life360, so we could know where each other was at any time. Due to an earlier threat by V to take the two youngest kids and move to California to be with the idiot from Facebook. Plus it had history, so I could at least prove my phone was in New Hampshire. Rebecca says she knows I was in New Hampshire and tells me she'll tell her mother that it wasn't me. The next day, I was served with a restraining order, an RO, claiming that I had vandalized V's patio furniture and that she felt afraid due to the letter bomb incident. The cop knew that it was nonsense, but the judge had no knowledge of the incident when V filed the restraining order and had to take her at her word. The restraining order was for 10 days, and then I could show up in court and contest it being continued. The officer who served the restraining order explained that he had to confiscate any firearms and licenses. While I did have a recently acquired Class A concealed carry license, actually from a couple's firearm course that was an anniversary gift from V the previous year, I hadn't any firearms other than a BB gun of Rebecca's. The officer left with just the Class A license, smiling as he said he was pretty sure I wasn't going to go on a rampage with a BB gun. The first thing I did the next day was to go to the police station and request all incident reports that involved me since I left her. I knew of seven incidents, but the desk sergeant informed me they had 19 incident reports from V. He talked to me a bit, clearly trying to get a feel for what kind of person I was and just what was going on. We parted company with him assuring me that the patrol officers would now know what was going on and the police department would do right by me so long as I kept my cool. Fair enough. Two nights before the court appearance to contest the restraining order, Sam, Marie, and I are sitting on their porch, drinking some brewskis and brainstorming about what I'm going to say to the judge. I'm a bit discouraged because I know it's going to be a he said, she said situation, and I'm living in Massachusetts. If your chromosomes don't match, you are a second class citizen when it comes to parental rights. Plus, V deserves an Oscar for how well she plays the victim. It wasn't looking good. My only hope was if V decided the restraining order itself was enough to make me look bad to the GAL and not show up and let the restraining order expire. Marie suddenly said, hey, let me see that restraining order. I handed it over to her. Hey, this is my judge. She's the judge that granted me the anti-harassment order against V. You're kidding. Sam and I look at each other in amazement. I swear it is. Let me go get it. Marie goes inside and comes back a few minutes later with her court order. Sure enough, it's the same judge. My grin felt like it was going to split my lips. Now I knew exactly what to do. And this is where the revenge begins. The court date to contest the restraining order arrived and I'm there first thing, just me. No lawyer, because he had to appear in court elsewhere. I strongly hoped that V wouldn't show up, but she did with someone other than her divorce lawyer and before court was in session her new lawyer approached me and offered to let the no contact order lapse but wanted a do not abuse order left in place. I politely declined her offer stating that I had done nothing to warrant either order and that I wanted the judge to hear my argument. V's lawyer was taken aback by this a bit and then shrugged as if to say it's your funeral and walked back 
to where V was sitting. We went in in front of the judge and V told her side of the story and I started telling mine, including all the incident reports from the police department, but V and her lawyer didn't have copies of all of them. So the judge sent us back to the gallery to await a second call while V and her lawyer reviewed the reports. When we were called back, the judge started to go into the content of the police reports and I stated that the content was almost irrelevant, but she insisted on going through them. During that, V emphasized the two incidents where I briefly entered V's apartment with her permission, but she characterized them as me doing so without her permission. I said that if necessary, I would be able to provide the communications where she gave me permission, but I didn't have them with me today. When going through the first police report from the night I found out about the online affair, wherein V claimed that I had brain lesions, V also tried to characterize me as having multiple personality disorder, as told to her by our our shared primary care physician. The judge asked her, So his doctor told you this without his permission? Yes, your honor. The judge looked at me puzzled. I shrugged and said, while slowly shaking my head in disbelief, I have a very close relationship with my doctor. I highly doubt he would violate HIPAA. She looked a little nonplussed, but... I think she got the message that V wasn't entirely being truthful. As that was the last police report to go, I reminded her that my point wasn't the content, but that I thought V was using the courts to harass and intimidate me and to make me look bad to the GAL. And I brought up that this isn't out of character for V as she has an anti-harassment order put in place against her, put there by... Your Honor, Your Honor. The judge blinked at that bit of information. I gave her the details and reminded her that V declined to show up at multiple hearings. As I recounted the particulars of Marie's story, the judge squinted her eyes more and more and her frown got deeper and deeper. She turned to V and her voice was slow, cold fury. Do you have an anti-harassment order in place against you? V's voice was so small and weak. Yes, your honor. I so wanted to look at V's face to see her reaction, but I kept my eyes locked on the judge. The judge pointed at V. Why didn't you show up to the hearings? A pause as V struggled to find some excuse. Because I didn't want to associate with that. But the judge waved her to silence. I think that was the turning point, as I think she was going to grant the request for the do not abuse, but she turned to me and sternly said, I think there is a bit of this going on both sides, but clearly she wants you to stay out of her apartment. Never again, your honor. Restraining order terminated. And with a bang of her gavel, we were done. Because the restraining order was terminated, legally that meant that it never happened. I got my class A concealed carry license back the next day and ultimately won the custody battle. A large part of which was the termination of the restraining order, but also due to V's subsequent increasingly poor emotional and verbal treatment of Rebecca. So am I the jerk for how I handled this? Before you decide, there is an update from the future. My ex-wife tries to frame me for theft. Here's the background. At this point in the saga, having lost the custody battle, V is moving to New Hampshire to be with her primary lover, now husband number five. A detail that amuses me to this day is that he shares the same first name as the Facebook lover from California as mentioned in the first post. I always refer to them as Paul number one and Paul number two when talking about them. Yes, I'm easily amused. So here's the incident. About a month after the custody hearing at which I got full physical custody of Rebecca, V and I had an email exchange in which we agreed that I would go to her apartment and take Rebecca's captain's bed and some of Rebecca's belongings the day before movers arrived to pack up Voldemort's stuff, V. She was moving 75 miles away to central New Hampshire. Having burned pretty much every bridge in that area, as Sam drives a truck, he graciously agreed to come along to both help and to be a witness. So we get there at 7.20 p.m. and knock at the door. After a brief wait, V opens the door, iPhone glued to her ear. She sullenly mumbles something about her stuff being upstairs and then heads off to her second floor bedroom, weaving and mumbling something that made me stop and think. I didn't quite get it, but I recall thinking, I really cannot go in here at all without a witness. I still stick my head out the door and say, Sam, come on, you need to come in with me. So we go in. 
Holy cow, it's not quite filthy, but it's beyond cluttered. By now, V has disappeared into her room, complete with slamming the door. So it takes me a bit of wandering to find Rebecca's room. It's not just that she's in the middle of packing, but there is crap everywhere. Dust, cobwebs, tracked in dirt, unwashed dishes, empty boxes of wine, dry dog food scattered and trampled underfoot. I could see that it's quite a nice place, an open living area with a balcony overlooking it and lovely woodwork and exposed beams and inset shelves in the walls. An antique wood stove on a hearth is blazing away. Really, lots of potential, but a tip nonetheless. So Sam and I start gathering up Rebecca's stuff and take some stuff out to the car. I realize we need an Allen wrench to take apart the bed, so I go out to the car to get one and come back in. In lull of the activity, she had come back into the living area, but went right back into her bedroom as we climbed the stairs, phone still glued to her ear. It takes a bit, but we finally get the bed taken apart and have moved most of the stuff in Rebecca's room out to the front lawn. Without conferring, it's clear that Sam and I both decided to get the stuff to the front lawn and not worry about packing the vehicles until after we're completely out of the house. It's at this point that things start to get weird. Sam is carrying out the second to last load when V pops out of her bedroom door, looks out from the balcony and says, why are you taking stuff out of my house? Sam drops what he's carrying and exits the house. He knew what was up instantly. I come out of Rebecca's room and V clearly didn't realize that I was there and say, you agreed via email that we would take Rebecca's bed tonight. She looks startled and says, is that Rebecca's stuff? Of course it is. You said her stuff was in her room. <laughs> Fine. She goes back into her bedroom. I take what I'm carrying and go outside. Sam says, dude, that's not right. We need to call the police. You're absolutely right. I could tell that Sam was expecting me to object and he does a double take when he realized that he wasn't going to have to convince me. Crowsville Police Department, you're on a recorded line. Yes, hi, my name is Jack Crow. I live at 321 Main Street here in Crowsville. While I'm talking to the police on the phone, I'm aware of V coming to the door and opening it and becoming quite agitated as she realizes that I'm talking to the police. By the time I finish the following explanation, she has slammed the door and is tromping around inside the living area, heatedly talking on her phone. I tell the police, I'm at my ex-wife's apartment getting some of my daughter's belongings as we had agreed to via email. And while I'm getting the last of the stuff out of the house, she suddenly asks, why are you taking stuff out of my house? So in order to protect all parties, I'm asking that a police officer come by to verify with Miss Crow that she agreed to this and that she is fine with what we have removed from the house. An officer will be right there, Mr. Crow. As I'm waiting for the officer to arrive, leaning nonchalantly against the front of Sam's truck, Sam is standing there next to me, just shaking his head. I'm going to call Marie and just let her know what's going on. Right about here, V throws the front door open, muttering something about not having gotten all of Rebecca's stuff, and proceeds to deposit another laundry basket piled high with clothes and other items on the front stoop, and then disappears back inside. I start to whistle, pop goes the weasel. Most of the stuff we moved is still sitting on the front lawn. We leave it there. About five minutes later, the officer arrives. He steps out of the patrol SUV and I slowly approach him, arm extended to shake his hand. Good evening, officer. I'm Jack Crow. Evening, Crow. Ali Johnson. We shake hands. I give him a brief explanation of the situation and he comments that I was right to call him and that he'll go speak to V. He's up there for about two minutes and then comes back down. You guys are good to go. We briefly chat with him, apologizing for having to get him involved and he replies, Now you did the right thing. If a woman in Massachusetts says something bad about you and you've got stuff dangling between your legs, you're going to be in trouble. I liked him a lot after that. We start loading the rest of the stuff and he asks, how much more is in the house? Nothing. It's all out here except that last laundry basket on the stoop that Miss Crow brought out while we were waiting for you. Oh, good. I can't sit here all night. If you guys are good to go, I'll take off. Wait, what's that? What's what? I think I saw a phone in that basket. He shines his flashlight on the laundry basket on the front stoop. I walk up to the basket. An iPhone is sitting on top of it. I pick it up and it looks like Rebecca's old iPhone 4. It's my daughter's old phone. I'll just take it with us. I carry the basket down to my car and put it in the back seat. Just as I'm walking away, it rings. Incoming call from V's landline. I realize it's V's phone. I pick it up and answer. Hello? Click. I look at the front. There's a text from Paul number two on the lock screen. Is he gone yet? Yep. 
It's her phone. Wait, officer, I was wrong. It's Miss Crow's phone. Could you return it to her? He takes it from me and returns it to V at the front door and walks back down to us. Okay, you are still good to go. I'm gonna go now. If you could, swing by again in 15 to 20 minutes. If we're still here, you might want to pull in and make sure we're still okay. Sounds good. You two take care now. Not five minutes after he pulls out, and while we're still loading stuff, V again pops out of the front door, phone glued to her ear. Is the officer officer still here? No. Get him back now. Why? I want him back. Get him. And back inside she goes. I'm briefly tempted to tell her if you want the cop back, you call for him. But that little voice in my head says, you call. So I did redial Crowsville's finest and request that officer, Officer Johnson, to return to the address. Again, Sam and I assume our waiting positions at the front of the truck. This is why I didn't want Rebecca here tonight. Good call, Sam said. A few minutes later, Officer Johnson arrives. Hey, Officer Johnson, long time no see. He grins at me. She came out the front door just after you left asking for the police to be called. I'll go see what she wants. He goes up there and V hands him her phone. He talks for a few minutes, hangs up the phone, continues to speak with V for 20 more seconds, and then returns to us. I look at him, quizzically. No worries guys, you're still good to go, but I'm gonna stay here until you're done. I continue to give him the raised eyebrow. She wanted to accuse you of trying to steal her phone, but I pointed out to her that I was the one to notice it in the basket that you hadn't touched yet, and that you were the one to to ask me to return it to her. Her boyfriend asked if you could be made to wait until Sunday, but I told him, no, they got three more things to load and then they're out of here. Just finish up, guys. We all want to go home where it's warm. We finished up and we all shook hands and got out of there. Having successfully avoided being framed by my ex-wife because we were lucky enough that the cop noticed the phone. So all things considered from the start to the very end, am I the jerk for how things played out? Let's break this down from the beginning. Part one, and then we'll go into part two. First off, it's sad that he had to live through this entire cheating while knowing it was happening. The way it's explained is a little bit strange because I can't understand why if he already knew the cheating was about to happen, why he wouldn't have intervened or tried to be separated before it happened, unless he thought it would help him in the custody battle in the future and in the divorce. It sounds like that's sort of implicit in what he's saying here, but he's not saying it directly. And as we see how things turn out later on in the story, that isn't exactly how it plays out, which begs the question again, Again, why put yourself through that? He specifically says, I left her the weekend after their hotel stay. She would spend the days with him and come home for the afternoon and evening without a shred of guilt showing in her actions. Having to live through that doesn't seem worth it just to get a couple extra private eye pictures of them leaving the hotel and all the other places that they took pictures of them. But maybe he thought it was worth it. And about the whole situation about entering her apartment and V saying that she didn't give him permission. It is funny that she thinks that if she deletes a text message on her her end, it'll be deleted on his end because that's obviously not how it works. But if that was such a crucial thing he was counting on, why wouldn't he bring that to court? He told the judge, I would be able to provide the communications where she gave me permission, but I don't have them with me today. What? Wasn't that one of the only things he felt like he had to stand on when he thought that he was going to be discriminated against because he was a male in this custody battle? I guess in the end, nothing really mattered other than the fact that V had ignored the court summons this entire time. And that's what ultimately swayed the judge in the OP favor. I feel bad for anyone that has to go anything like this on either side. Then in part two, the OP clearly is on edge because he has set up every precaution he possibly can. He's using some 200 IQ prediction methods to try and figure out what her whole scheme is. He even brings Sam with him so he's not alone with her so she can't just randomly say something and then it becomes a he said she said situation. It is interesting that both him and Sam had the intuition to call the police right then and there when from the perspective of the audience, it's not exactly obvious why they would do so. They just thought that something was off and it turns out something was off. At the time, they just couldn't figure out what it was and it ended up being the police officer who saw the phone in the basket to begin with. She was the one that was trying to pin the theft of the phone on them and she almost got away with it if it wasn't noticed at that point. So let me know if you guys have ever experienced something like this in your own lives and if so, feel free to submit your own stories via the link in the description. And of course, let me know down below jerk or not a jerk and why. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications. To finish listening to all the stories in this series, use the playlist at the top of the description. And next time you live stream, use the cream of the crop music. Search for cream of the stream on Spotify or whatever music platform you use for copyright free music to use for your stream. It's free cream of the stream. Either way, thanks a lot for listening. We'll see you guys next time.